tonight I'm very pleased to have an old friend address Westminster, Patrick Clausen, uh, who was an old friend from uh, my Voice of America World Net TV days on a weekly foreign policy talk program called On the Line, which we regularly drew upon Patrick's expertise on the Middle East and most especially Iran, which is the subject he's going to address tonight. He's the Morning Star Senior Fellow and Director of Research at the Washington Institute, where he directs the Iran Security Initiative. He has written prolifically, uh, author or contributing author to 18 books or studies on Iran, including Iran's strategic intentions and capabilities, eternal Iran, continuity and chaos, and getting ready for a nuclear-ready Iran. I hope that's not a plot violation in relation to your topic, which is a question mark as to whether they'll last that long. Uh, he's also <coughs> appeared regularly with op-eds, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, etc. Prior to joining the Washington Institute, uh, Patrick was a senior research professor at the National Defense University's Institute for National Strategic Studies. He was a senior economist at the World Bank at the International Monetary Fund. His PhD is from the New School for Social Research. And his topic tonight is, will the Islamic Republic last long enough to get a nuclear bomb? Please join me in welcoming Patrick Clark. Since Bob mentioned uh, one of my books, uh, Getting Ready for Nuclear Ready Iran, uh, I have to brag that um, that book uh, was uh, found on the bookshelves of uh, Osama bin Laden when uh, there was a raid on his compound. So I know it was widely read. Pres presumably he downloaded it, but uh, my... No residuals? Unfortunately. <laughs> uh, so pardon me if I'm telling you things that you already know, but uh, I thought that it was important to <clears throat> discuss a bit about Iran's nuclear program now, pardon me if I massacre that word. Um, I spent a number of years on a, a distinguished advisory panel at Sandia National Labs, and I was amused to discover that many of the people who design and build these weapons use the word nuclear rather than the correct pronunciation, <laughs> nuclear. <laughs> I don't feel quite as, how shall I put it, uneducated when I slip. Anyway, uh, Iran, uh, right now is a somewhat controversial issue. And we saw a recent uh, op-ed in the New York Times that was claiming that, uh, cl that the uh, allegations being made by the administration about uh, Iran's uh, nefarious activities that are an attempt to stampede us into war, much as it was done uh, before the uh, 2002 invasion of Iraq. Uh, and uh, I just want to recount for everybody what we know about Iran's nuclear program from what they themselves have told us and have showed off to journalists as well as to inspectors in the International Atomic Energy Agency. The largest facility of concern is the one in which uh, Iran has most of its centrifuges which are the devices that can be used to make fuel for nuclear power plants or that can be used uh, to enrich uranium further for a nuclear weapon. Now, just to review, Iran has got a nuclear power plant, so you can say, well, of course they have a plant to make fuel for their nuclear power plant, except there's this minor detail that the contract that they have with the Russians about that fuel plant is that 100% of its fuel for its entire lifetime will come from Russia and will be returned to Russia when it's done. So the Iranians acknowledge that none of the enriched uranium they're making at Natanz will ever end up in the nuclear power plant the Russians have built. The Iranians claim that they will need this fuel for when they design a nuclear power plant and build it, which led the French government to propose in the negotiations that well, when you start construction of that nuclear power plant, well, then, then why don't you start up Natanz, right? But anyway, this uh, facility at Natanz uh, for enriching nuclear fuel 
is the size of three football fields. It covers seven times the area of the Pentagon. And just to make sure that it's not damaged by rain, it has three, three meters of dirt on top of it. <laughs> That's, of course, what you do with every building, right? Now, it prepares the thought that you're concerned that somebody might want to bomb it. This is not a modest effort. Oh, and by the way, that's just the main facility. After it was discovered, because the Iranians, oh, we forgot to tell the International Atomic Energy Agency about this plant, the Iranians built another plant. This time, under a mountain. Not just inside the mountain, under a mountain. Where they would put several thousand centrifuges. Each centrifuge is roughly the size of a um, refrigerator. Now, the smaller facility at Fordow has got enough space for centrifuges that would produce the fuel for somewhere between, depending on how sophisticated they are, the Iranians are at designing a bomb, somewhere between two and seven bombs a year. If the towns were fully built out, we'd be talking somewhere between 50 and 200 bombs a year. The Times is not fully built out. Um, and just to remind people, giving the fissile material, the highly enriched uranium and the plutonium, that's the hard part of building a nuclear weapon. Actually assembling the explosive device is not that hard. Um, I remember being at Los Alamos and asking, well, gee, how hard is it to assemble that? And somebody pointed to the shack across the way and said, well, that's where we did it in 1945. Uh, and we don't know how long it took us in 1945, but we do know that from the time the fissile material uh, left Oak Ridge until the time it was dropped in Japan was two weeks. Now, we did it the easy way, which is we assembled a big, fat, heavy bomb and dropped it from a plane. And I have to admit that that's probably not going to work for the Iranians. So they've been working on missiles. You hear a lot about the Iranian missile program. Uh, and um, they have been developing missiles which are conveniently sized to carry a nuclear weapon of the early Soviet design. However, the tricky part with a, is not the, so much the missile, uh, but as the North Koreans have discovered, it's the warhead. And making a warhead that can survive reentry is, praise the Lord, hard to do. And the North Koreans have not yet mastered that, and there's no indications that the Iranians have. But anyway, uh, they're working away on this thing. So that's where their program stands. And then we get a, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, JCPOA. Please don't call that an agreement. It's not an agreement. It is a joint declaration of the actions which each of the parties plans to take. Nobody signed anything. Nobody made any agreement. This is a unilateral declaration of the various parties, the steps they plan to take. That was quite important for both sides, or for all the sides, and in particular for Iran and the United States. Because neither the Iranians nor the US wanted this to go through legislative approval. It would never have gotten approved by a majority of either House of Congress, much less be ratified as a treaty. So anyway, that's the, the we have the JCPOA, agreed to a little over two, uh, almost three years ago now. Now, uh, the most accurate way to describe what the JCPOA does is that it parks the Iranian nuclear program for a while. The Obama folks often spoke about it dismantling parts of the program. Well, there were a couple of parts that got dismantled, but frankly, not very much got dismantled and it didn't get very dismantled. In fact, 
chief, uh, the head of the Iranian Atomic Energy Organization, has uh, taken to describing it as something that they could reverse within a few months. I don't think he's right, but the point is, it, they didn't dismantle much. And on the other hand, the, the Iranians were allowed to continue their research on advanced centrifuges. They can't put them into action yet, but they can continue their research. So when you put this out together, I would say, basically, the JCPOA parks the Iranian program until about 2025. Uh, there are sunset clauses for most of the provisions of the JCPOA, and most of the stuff that matters goes away either in 2025 or in 2030. The parts that stay are the Iranian promises, oh, we'll never build a bomb. Well, since they're members of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, they've already pledged not to build a bomb. They've made a treaty commitment. Uh, but they restate it in nicer words, fancier. But um, what they can do after 2025 is they can build, um, and they can build as many as they want of these quite advanced centrifuges that were four times as good as the centrifuges that they had when the agreement w went into effect. Uh, after 2030, they can have any kind of centrifuge they want, and uh, they can also start reprocessing, which is a way to um, get uh, plutonium, which is the other fissile material. Um, they also had accepted some limitations <laughs> on what they would do in that facility under the mountain, and those go away in 2030. So it's fair to say, and by the way, Iran put into the JCPOA very explicitly that they claim the right um, after 2025 to enrich uranium up to 90% level, which is ideal for bombs. Anything above 25% is considered highly enriched uranium, and the Iranians say that they have the right to enrich up to 90%. So um, after these sunset clauses, uh, frankly, it's pretty fair to say that uh, Iran's nuclear program will have few constraints on it and will enjoy the international legitimacy of being what Iran always said it would do in this agreement between, uh, it's not called an agreement, in this joint plan of action. Well, when the first nuclear agreement was reached with the Iranians, two years before the final accord, uh, Henry Kissinger and George Schultz wrote a long editorial and a long op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, in which they said, okay, we've now kind of paused the Iranian nuclear program. The big question is, what are we going to do with the time we've gained? And I think that's a very fair question. And in many ways, that was the comment that John Kerry made the other day at the, um, in Munich at the Verkunde, in which he said that, OK, the Iran deal is not perfect, but it causes things. He said 15 years, I, I would say 10 to 15 years. What are we going to do with the time? And that is the big question. What are we going to do with the time? I mean, I am reminded, I was around and kicking at National Defense University, um, when the agreement with the North Koreans was reached, and the widespread expectation at that time was that the North Korean regime was going to collapse anyway. So who cared what you agreed to let them have in 10 years? They weren't going to be there in 10 years. Eh, wrong. So what are we even doing with the time that we gained with this JCPOA? At the time that it was entering into effect, I and a group of other eminent other people I'm in it, not me. Uh, we came out with a statement in which one of the things we said was, look, you've got to use this time in order to press Iran, in order to achieve agreement 
about what's going to happen when this thing expires. And the Obama people, they, they, they took the statement more seriously than we did. I got invited to the old executive office building more time that, that was a couple months than I had before ever since. Um, and, and they insisted that they would press Iran. But of course, they didn't. Because the natural impulse of diplomats, when an agreement like this goes into effect, is to say, oh, we can't now raise all these contentious and difficult issues because if we do, the Iranians will walk away from the deal. And so therefore, the Obama administration was unwilling to press the Iranians on a whole host of things. There was a recent major article uh, that about um, drug enforcement agent, uh, agency administration people who were very upset that uh, they weren't allowed to proceed with some cases about drug smuggling. But, and um, uh, there were a lot of other things, and including a number of nuclear things, where we did not press the Iranians. But now, under the Trump administration, there's a quite a different dynamic. And it's interesting to watch, because what we've seen is that, in particular, the French, who had always said that this deal was not very good, and that they could have gotten a better deal if they'd negotiated it, which, by the way, is probably true. Uh, they have, and, and the former President Macron, have stepped forward to say, let's start now forging a consensus about what happens when those sunset clauses kick in. And the interesting phenomena is that the hardest-lined people in the U.S. Senate about Iran, in particular Senator Cotton from Arkansas, have echoed the same line and said, look, let's not go back and wage the battles of the past about whether or not the JCPOA was or was not a good deal. But let's instead concentrate on what comes next. And how can we make sure that if the Iranians do pursue a bomb after the sunset clauses, that we're going to really come down on like a ton of bricks. So what Senator Cotton has proposed is that rather than focusing on whether or not to walk away from the JCPOA, what we should focus on is getting a broad international consensus that if the Iranians do the things that they claim they have the right to do, like make 90% enriched uranium, that we are really going to hit them hard with all kinds of sanctions and with a vigorous uh, military presence around Iran to deter them. I don't know. I don't know if that's going to happen or not. But one thing I can say with great confidence is that there were some people in the Obama administration, although the president's own view is not quite so clear, he gave mixed signals, but certainly a number of important people in his administration felt that this nuclear deal would be the start of a process of change, that we would show Iran that by cooperating with the international community, they get a lot of benefits. And therefore, that this was going to lead Iran to begin to cooperate in other areas as well. And that what we'd see is an Iran that became more of a country and less of a cause. To echo Mr. Kissinger's famous question about it, that Iran had to decide if it's a country or a cause. And so the hope was that we'd see a more cooperative Iran on a variety of other fronts. Unfortunately, what's happened since the JCPOA came into effect is the exact opposite. And in particular, Iran's revolutionary guards have said, all right, if you're going to do that deal, then we have to show that we remain the leaders, the access of resistance, by pushing ahead even firmer and that's what they've done, in particular, in Syria and in Yemen. So in Syria, Iran not only has deployed a substantial number, uh, low thousands, of its own soldiers, but it has also recruited at least 20,000 other foreigners, mostly Pakistanis and Iraqis, uh, the Ad Afghan, uh, to go fight in Syria. 
and it, it has raised a large militia in Syria of people who it trains and pays. So General McMaster has said that 80% of those who are fighting on behalf of the Assad government are under Iranian command. The Assad government does such charming things as agree to a de-escalation zone in this suburb of Damascus that's still rebel controlled, and then the last few days has been dropping barrel bombs on hospitals and killing hundreds of innocent civilians. Meanwhile, in Yemen, the Iranians walk into a situation where there's a domestic civil war going on, and the Iranians pour gasoline on this, contrary to UN Security Council resolutions, which say that uh, we, should, we should help and support the internationally recognized government. The Iranians uh, work with the rebels who are fighting that government, um, and uh, the Iranians don't don't particularly make an effort to hide what they're trying to do. So, for instance, at their uh, last fall, oh no, a year ago, there was a, um, a missile that the Houthis fired uh, at a, a U.S. ship in the Red Sea. And now, the Houthis could have taken a missile that belonged to the former Yemeni government, but they didn't. They used a new style missile, which it, the Yemenis had never had. Which, would you, be, would you believe it, the Iranians produce. So it's kind of like saying, well, guess where this came from? And then, at least that was at sea where we didn't recover the missile. But then earlier, uh, or just a few months ago, the Houthis fired a uh, missile at Riyadh, at the international airport, almost hit the airport. And uh, guess what? <laughs> we recover the missile parts. And I will say this, for once the US government was prepared to uh, would put a lot of pressure on the Saudi government uh, to let the UN experts from the UN body of experts looking at the sanctions on Yemen uh, to go and take a look at the missiles. And they came out with a report last week in which they said, this missile was made in Iran. And more than that, it was made in Iran at a date after the UN sanctions, which, which forbid sending weapons to, to the Houthis. So the hopes that some of the Obama administration had that uh, the Iranian government would change ain't happened. So what I said so far is pretty discouraging. So now I want to change gears. And I want to talk about why the Iranian regime might, in spite of everything we're doing, not last until it has a nuclear weapon. And that is, the Iranian regime's got a minor little problem. It's people. <laughs> Inconvenient. And what we have seen on several different occasions is large-scale protests. Uh, those protests in... in uh, in the protests in 1999 and in 2009, in each case, brought more than 2 million people to the streets of Tehran, demanding change. But the demands were for change within the system, advancing the reform politicians. In the 2009 protests, after they'd been going on for a while, and there was a lot of suppression in the protests, we started hearing people saying, to hell with the whole system. But well, that was not the majority voice. <clears throat> what we saw last December was very interesting. Because what we saw in December was protests that were not in Tehran, not by the middle and upper classes and educated people of Tehran saying, we don't like this system. It was in the heartland. It was ordinary working Iranians in more than 80 smaller towns and villages around the country in fact, we suspect, and the, now that more videos are coming out and more YouTubes, we looks like there may have been as many as 255 towns and villages involved. And these ordinary people had no patience. Their demands were death the dictator, and we don't want the reformers, we don't want the hardliners, we don't want the Islamic Republic. It, it rhymes in Persian. 
whoops, this is the base of the Islamic Republic. This is the people who they've always thought were behind them and that they could count on. And that while those effete snobs of North Tehran, the heartland was with us. Eh, no. Uh, and what's happened is exactly what Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei has spent 20 years warning might happen. He has spent 20 years warning that there could be a cultural invasion from the West. And that this cultural invasion of Western values would be subversive of the Islamic Republic. He's given many speeches in which he explains that mini skirts are more dangerous than tanks. Mm -hmm. And he has made clear that what he really worries about is not Washington, it's Hollywood. You want to get an idea of his vision of what he thinks American policy towards Iran is? It's Michelle Obama handing the Oscar award to Argo. That's proof that, Wash that the US government and Hollywood are in cahoots to overthrow the Islamic Republic. That's what he worries about, okay? Uh, and what he worries about is all those thousands of Iranian women who've been standing up and having taken pictures of themselves without their head covering on. And they, like the people in these protests, are not afraid. So they stand up there and say, my name is so-and-so, I live at this address, and here's my national card, my national ID number. Come and get me. You know, if you were running a highly ideological state and you face this problem, you got a problem. You got a problem. Uh, and okay, you can say, well, these protests, they have no leadership, they're not organized, and all that's true. They have no leadership and they're not organized. But frankly, the Islamic Republic is smelling more and more like Brezhnev Soviet Union. People don't believe it any longer. All right. Now, the history of the Middle East is a sad history, about as, about as bad as that as Russia, in which what happens is that ideological regimes are replaced by corrupt di semi-dictatorships or dictatorships not by free societies, kind of like Russia. However, I have to say that at least in the Middle East, uh, some of those corrupt states are, are not so aggressive. Some of them become hyper-aggressive, Saddam Hussein, uh, but some of them, the Assad family in Syria, uh, are not at all aggressive. So we'll have to see. Even if Iran goes down that route, it's possible that its people may not get what they want, but it's frankly, it's possible we would get what we want as our absolute essential criteria, namely a less aggressive Iran. Someday, however, I am worried that we will see the same phenomenon in Iran that we saw in India, which for a long time had a latent nuclear capability. Um, and then someday, some politician wants to make it real. Now, the judgment of the US intelligence community for a long time has been that Iran is not going to go the route of uh, the North Korea, of assembling a crude device and then exploding it to say, we've got a weapon, or we've got a, we've got a nuclear bomb, we've got a nuclear device. It's not really a bomb, it was a device. You know, the, in other words, it took tinkering with a thing and getting it, fixing it before um, uh, they could test it. But um, the intelligence community has argued that instead, Iran would wait until it could have an arsenal of at least a handful of weapons that it could deliver one way or another. Because if Iran just had one device, that would be a way of saying, we're armed, we got dangerous intentions, and that would be an invitation for somebody, Israel, United States, Saudi Arabia, 
uh, to preempt. We, we'll, we'll see. I don't know. Meanwhile, the other, many of the other states in the Middle East are beginning to hedge. Front page of the Wall Street Journal today, it was here earlier, uh, an article about the, um, how the Saudis are um, starting, to build, starting to talk about building nuclear power plants. No more to talk about. They're going to let a contract before too long. And uh, they're saying they want to have the capability to, enhance, to enrich uranium if they feel it's necessary. So other countries are beginning to hedge. Um, although I have to say that it's interesting that our main concern has historically been Iran's nuclear program. Whereas, especially the Gulf Arab countries, their main concern has long been Iran's aggressive ambitions. And for many years during the nuclear negotiations, the Gulf countries warned the United States that if there were a nuclear deal, that Iran would pursue its aggressive ambitions by non-nuclear means. And so the uh, Saudis in particular said that if the United States does a nuclear deal with Iran, that would be at the expense of Saudi interests, because we would in effect be letting Iran pursue its ag aggressive ambitions by non-nuclear means. And uh, the Saudis like to say, we're not at the table, we're on the table. Right? Uh, and the Saudis regard what happened in Yemen and the missile landing at, outside Riyadh airport as proof that they were right. So um, my focus tonight has been on the Iranian nuclear program. But let me make it clear that I think that even if we are able to persuade the Iranians uh, not to go further with a nuclear program, that's not the end of our troubles with Iran. And indeed, I know one eminent expert on nuclear things who says uh, that what a mistake it was for the Iranians to pursue a bomb. If they'd just gone on sponsoring terrorism and persecuting their own people, the world would have paid no attention. <laughs> but because they were pursuing the bomb, we woke up to the fact that we got all these problems with Iran, right? And it's now harder for them to get away with persecuting their own people and sponsoring terrorism. That's a bit cynical, but also a bit true. So I will leave it on that optimistic note <laughs> and see, see if there's any questions. Right in front. Can you wait for the microphone? Oh, may I wait for the microphone? Because while I can hear you, uh, those who are right, those in watching us um, on camera cannot. Thank you, Professor. Great presentation. Uh, early on, you talked about the uh, Iran's building of missiles and how they hadn't quite gotten this reentry vehicle thing figured out. Right. Um, what if they decide they will eschew that and just go for a, a detonation in, outside the atmosphere? How dangerous might that be? Well, um, th that's an interesting possibility. And uh, of course, that's one of the things which is concerned the people who are worried about an electromagnetic pulse over the United States and so on, and going to more blasted conferences about that than I care to think about. Um, for those who don't know, a, a weapon exploded outside the atmosphere could cause electromagnetic pulse. It's not clear how powerful it would be and how extensive it would be. Uh, the one thing which I gather from people from the, from the electrical power industry is very clear is that it would be nowhere near as uh, powerful or dangerous as some of the solar flares that we might have in the next few decades. And that uh, the way we've interconnected all of our electronic devices, we've created a magnificent antenna for magnifying the effects of electromagnetic pulses, be they from solar flares or from nuclear weapons. And so therefore, we need to invest quite a bit of money in protecting ourselves from electromagnetic pulse because we can't stop the sun from flaring. 
Um, and so it would, and, and the possibility of an Iranian bomb or other EMP bomb is yet another reason to do it. Um, and this is, what's fascinating about these conferences is that the driver, which is really going to cause the electrical power industry to do something about this, is the insurance companies. Because mm -hmm. the insurance companies are saying, we're not going to insure your new power plants unless you do something about this. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it, um, and by the way, we see the same phenomenon in the Middle East. The people who are in, really push the Saudis to do something about protecting their critical infrastructure projects were the insurance companies, which refused to insure them until the Saudis created a 30,000 person infrastructure production force. Um, with Sandia's help. Um, so it's possible, uh, but there are no indications that the Iranians have done any work on that. Zip. Zero. Zilch. There are more indications that the Iranians have, have done some work on um, uh, how to deliver bombs that are launched from short range um, uh, rockets uh, launched off of conventional ships. They did that in the Caspian on uh, at least one occasion. Um, and of course, the Iranians have been, for years, have encouraged various of their groups to deliver bombs by uh, very powerful, very heavy bombs, uh, by truck. Um, so there are mechanisms besides missiles, uh, but the um, strong judgment of the intelligence community has been that the Iranians aren't going to be confident in those and would insist want to have uh, a missile by, with which they can deliver things. And, and the physics of it is if you've got a missile that goes more than a certain distance, uh, it's going to leave the atmosphere, and therefore you have the reentry problem. So I'm not, an, not a rocket engine, but you know, one of the nice things about working in problems like this is I get to go to all these conferences and listen to people who actually know something and teach me things about <laughs> engineering and rockets and so on and so forth. So. <laughs> Do I understand correctly that as part of this uh, declaration, do I understand correctly that as part of the, uh, the declaration, if it's not an agreement, um, our government actually uh, released a, a huge amount of funds to the, to the Iranians and if that's the case with the additional financial potential uh, to do a lot of things with those funds. Um, what might be the feasibility of them uh, doing an EMP over the United States uh, over the next 10 years? Well, on there are two kinds of funds that were controversial in the agreement. One is that, as a part of the sanctions, the United States had persuaded a number of countries that took deliveries of Iranian oils to block the payment. The US position was, during the sanctions period, was we didn't mind if people imported Iranian oil. We just didn't want them to pay for it. <laughs> okay? So um, the Japanese and the Chinese and the South Koreans and the Indians blocked the payment. So there was a large amount of money that was sitting in certain accounts that the Iranians could only use to buy goods in those countries. Now, this money wasn't frozen. It was kind of was like a Slurpee. It was kind of half frozen, half liquid. Um, and the Iranians were learning how to make it more liquid. They were learning how to use the money. So um, the Iranians were getting their hands and using the money more and more. And that was big bucks. Um, probably not $150 billion, but certainly well over $50 billion. So that was one controversial pile of money. Uh, but frankly, it was never frozen. Uh, there were some small parts of work, but most of it was not frozen. And the Iranians were learning how to melt it. Um, there was another controversy about something which happened on the day the agreement went into effect, which is the United States government delivered um, about um, somewhere between 400 and 800 million dollars in currency notes, US dollar bills, um, at a Swiss airport uh, to the Iranians. And the Iranians released uh, several dual nationals who they'd been holding. Now, 
it was remarkably remarkable that the Obama administration made this look as crooked as they did. I had been involved for 20 years in the efforts, which date back to the Reagan administration, uh, to come to a final settlement in all the claims back and forth between the United States and Iran uh, from the Shah states. And the US government had been, has been pressing for more than 25 years to bring an end to that process so the US government can say, that's done, that's buried, that's over with. And the Iranians have not wanted to because they wanted to claim that we never returned the Shah's money. The Shah actually didn't have that much money. We returned whatever the Iranians could prove that he'd been taking it legitimately. But the Iranians wanted to drag this process out. And we have spent decades trying to bring it to an end. The Obama people brought it to an end. That was a considerable successful achievement of US diplomacy. And we all knew that when it came to an end, we were going to owe the Iranians a wad of cash because they had prepaid for a bunch of arms, which they had never gotten delivered. And on top of that, the Obama people managed to get, use this as a way to get the Iranians to release some American dual nationals they were holding. Not bad. You had to return the money anyway. You wanted to end this thing, and you got the people released. It took really hard work to, by covering it up, lying about it, and, and, um, and generally, generally uh, playing ignorant to make this look stupid. You could have brought out Reagan administration people who worked on this issue to explain what an accomplishment this was. They didn't want to embarrass the Iranians by saying, well, the Iranians finally caved and agreed to end this dispute that's been going on needlessly. I mean, we've had a tribunal in The Hague since 1981 that's supposed to adjudicate these claims. It hasn't issued a judgment in 10 years and still spends $7 million a year. Right? Not a bad job. Right? Um, so anyway. That was the second pile of money. The second part. Oh, about the EMP. Look, I, I have no idea. Technical feasibility. Oh, I have no idea. I have just no idea. We have, we have no evidence the Iranians have been working on an EMP. And um, people have very different opinions. As I say, my attitude about an EMP is that because we have to worry about solar flares, we are darn well should protect ourselves against an EMP. If you're protecting yourself against solar flares, protecting yourself against an EMP costs teeny, 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 teeny amounts of money. Because uh, it's very similar things, right? They're sudden, they're unexpected, you don't know about it, you, and, and it's a, a very similar physical phenomenon. So uh, we ought to get off our butts and protect ourselves against solar flares. And when we do that, we'll protect ourselves against an EMP. Thank you. Okay. Yes, yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Iranian. Please. Question, please. One is, uh, you mentioned the Bimbalo briefly. The view is amongst the Iranian that actually that film was itself uh, a promoter of the interest of the Iranian government rather than the opposite. Because it was believed, and I don't want to go into detail of that because there were a couple of scenes in the film that actually, uh, but let's not go into that. You mentioned the US intelligence community. I remember during the last years of George Bush, the junior president, Suddenly, uh, a group of intelligence communities issued a report when there was the talk for the prospect or the talk of the uh, United States attacking Iran. And uh, it appeared to many Iranians that the intelligence community was rather biased and partisan in its, in its opinion. And I just wanted to ask your opinion how, uh, how unbiased and how impartial are the intelligence communities? And my last question is, do you believe that the uh, United States government, the current government, is aware of the differences and divergences and perhaps rivalries with the European government as it regards Iran, which is one of the largest gas fields in the world? So um, let me start with the backwards. Um, the Trump administration, in fact, has been in intense negotiations, discussions with the, with the European governments about uh, Iran 
uh, for a number of months. And ever since uh, Trump's October 12th speech, in which he said, hey, listen, we've got to get some action from Congress in Europe or else we're going to walk off the deal. Um, th there have been very active, uh, I think it was this last week, that then yet another day of discussions in, in um, I think it was going to be Brussels this time. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. But anyway, uh, the, the Trump in his October 12th speech outlined the things that he thought needed to be done in order to stay with the deal. And um, they, they were what Senator Cotton had recommended in the speech he made a few weeks earlier. Um, and they were, um, um, we got to do something about the missiles. We got to do something about the sunset clauses. And we have to do something about uh, some ambiguities about enforcement that um, the, the IAEA head, um, um, Mr. Romano, um, has said uh, there are the ambiguities that need to be clarified. And so um, what Cotton recommended, what Trump picked up, was three things that the Europeans could imagine themselves doing. So that was seen as a positive step, that rather than laying down some things that no way Europe is going to agree to, that Trump actually put down markers that it, it's conceivable it's conceivable you could get a bill through Congress about this. Um, uh, the current atmosphere in Congress is acidic and very difficult to get a bill. Uh, but um, Senators Corker and Cardin have been negotiating with their caucuses as much as with each other. Uh, trying to get a consensus in the bill. And, uh, you know, it's conceivable. It's conceivable. So what Trump laid down is what needs to be done. You know, he, he says he picked three areas that were, <clears throat> two of the three were areas that, that uh, French President Macron <coughs> had signaled he thought needed to be done. <coughs> so well, we'll see what happens. Um, I would say on the intelligence community, there, there, look, there is a problem of groupthink in the intelligence community on many issues. Uh, it's... You know, you, 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 many of these issues are difficult to know. To know. Uh, our track record of predicting revolutions is terrible. Uh, our track record at knowing where countries are with their WMD programs is terrible. We seriously underestimated Iran's progress, and we missed their facilities several different times. So, um, and it's very hard to speak out, out and disagree with your colleagues. So there is a group think problem. Um, but I don't think that's a, I don't think it's a conscious bias problem. Uh, I think these are dedicated professionals who are determined to figure out as best they can what's going on. And it's pretty darn tough. It's pretty darn tough. And um, I don't expect 100% success. Um, I do get nervous by the extent to which, especially the political leadership of the intelligence community and the politicians who listen to the previous <laughs> intelligence community, um, assume that what they're being told is true. I'd rather the people hedge their bets a bit more. So I'd like us to hedge our bets on a whole variety of fronts. Uh, so, um, but. As I said, I don't think that, that's not a conscious bias problem. Okay. And then Claire first, and then Joey. Hi, Patrick. It's good to see you. Thank you very much um, for the presentation. Um, this year marks uh, more or less the 30th year of the Iranian nuclear weapons program. Um, there is no country on the face of the earth that has taken 30 years to <laughs> develop a nuclear uh, device. Um, so you, you've talked about the, the overt program, Natanz and Isfahan and, and, and the rest, Fardo now. Um, but of course, the first 14 years of their program was completely covert until it got revealed by the Iranian opposition. What do you think about the covert program? And is that where they're developing their nuclear weapons in places like Archen and Labizan 3 and um, and the other sites. Well, look, um, as you point out, the Iranians have turned out to be utterly, utterly incompetent to this effort. Utterly incompetent effort. It's really quite remarkable how badly they've done. Right? Um, and um, it's also the case that after Natanz was found, 
uh, the world's intelligence communities, many countries' intelligence communities, suddenly started paying a great deal more attention. And since then, uh, the Iranians have been remarkably unsuccessful at hiding things. So it's quite possible they have things we don't know about. It's a big country, lots of people, pension for, I mean, well, look, I'll give you an example, okay? Uh, in the last month, there has been a whole campaign of arresting environmentalists in Iran. A prominent Canadian Iranian environmentalist died in prison. To a person, the Iranian social media world is convinced that's because the environmentalists accidentally stumbled on a number of, of nuclear sites. Maybe they're right, maybe they're not, I don't know. But to a person, they're convinced that that's the reason this is happening, okay? I don't know. But I am quite certain that the US intelligence community is paying attention to that. Now, we at the Washington Institute give a book prize each year. And two years ago, we gave a prize to a book called The Twilight Wars by David Christ, who's actually at the Pentagon. He works in the office of the historian, but he's been an advisor to the last couple of CENTCOM commanders. Uh, and it's about the Twilight Wars between the United States and Iran. And there are a lot of very interesting episodes. I, God only knows how he got that stuff declassified. But, I mean, you know, he describes a scene where um, a, a Navy SEAL raiding party was 30 seconds from being uh, feet dry and on going into uh, Iran in uh, 1990, in, excuse me, in 2004. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so there's been a lot of oh, also scenes where <laughs> deputy director of the CIA meets with his Iranian counterpart in 2006. Um, so there are a lot of things that have been going on, right? I mean, I'm reminded of the time when the New York Times correspondent called me up and said, uh, uh, this is 10 years ago, did I think that the Israelis were going to attack the Iranian nuclear program? And I said, absolutely. He said, how can you be so certain? I said, because it started two years ago because they'd started assassinating Iranian scientists. So uh, we've been in a twilight war, uh, uh, and we've been hunting for Iranian uh, facilities. Um, the longtime deputy director of the AEA, Oli Heinonen, who was in charge of inspections in Iran, he likes to say that if Iran does not have a nuclear uh, clandestine program now, it'll be the first time in 30 years they don't. <laughs> right. um, we don't know. You know, we don't know what we don't know. Uh, but what we do know with great confidence and uh, absolute certainty is that neither the American people nor anybody around the world is going to believe a U.S. intelligence judgment that Iran has got nuclear weapons facilities that's not supported by IAEA inspections. That's a legacy of the Iraq war. Ain't nobody going to believe it until the IAEA inspectors get out there. That's a reality. Ain't no president, including this one, going to act on that kind of intel until the IEA has been out there to inspect it. That's just a reality. Please. Um, that reputation is well. Yeah. The, the, the um, response of the American people that you were hypothesizing um, is, is a hard-earned one by the, by the Iranians. I mean, it's not, and by the intelligence community. No, no, no. By, me, is, is a, one that the intelligence community has, has, has earned. Uh, and it's, when, when I when you did your remarks tonight, which I greatly appreciate and learned from, um, you, you were focused on the real world rather than hypothetical or Critiquing an arms control agreement or any any other abstraction. So when you when you are confident that they're a good amount of time away from being able to miniaturize a weapon and put it on a missile, you know I'm uplifted by that. You're a skeptic. So when you come to that conclusion, it's good news for me. Okay. So you know I mean, but but if we know that, then we can verify the agreement real confidently. Well, and look. The parts, of, the parts of the JCPOA, which, which frankly, can't be verified. And it's absurd that we ever put some of the clauses into the agreement. 
because, um, for instance, there, there's a clause in there um, which, say, in which Iran pledges that it will do no computer modeling of nuclear weapons. And the IAEA is supposed to verify this. Now, Amano has said, how the heck am I supposed to verify that no computer in Iran has been used to do computer modeling of a nuclear weapon? What am I supposed to do? Bug every computer in Iran? I mean, it was a stupid provision to put in there. I mean, I don't understand why you put in provisions which are inherently non-monitorable. And there's a number of those, OK? And it's a problem. But the biggest single problem that we have, frankly, is not monitoring the agreement. The biggest problem we have is what happens if someday the DPRK decides to sell a nuclear weapon to the Iranians, and the Iranians decide to buy it. Um, we probably wouldn't know about it until it happened. We might not know about it until after it happened. Uh, and given that the Iranians and the DPRK have cooperated in missile development for over 30 years, uh, and that, in fact, it was missiles provided by Iran, which were the foundation and heart of the DPRK's initial missile program. I'm more worried about that than I am about most things. About that. If you ask me what would be a way in which Iran could suddenly have very dangerous capabilities, which it does not today have, my answer is purchasing it from the DPRK. And if you ask me what clandestine facilities are you most worried about, it's that the Iranians, the Iranian clandestine facility is located in the DPRK. <laughs> that would be my biggest worry. Don't think it's happening there? Pardon? I don't think it's happening, but we wouldn't know. We wouldn't find out. To follow up on your comments about uh, internal political instability in Iran, uh, some say that despite the Trump's administration's very good intentions and their very dramatic differences with the previous administration, uh, the bureaucracy hasn't really been uh, effectively used to support internal political Iranian instability. For example, the Voice of America, perhaps Dr. Riley knows a lot about that. People, the Voice of America, are holdovers from the Obama administration. They reported, Voice of America report has uh, given reports that are favorable to the Iranian administration according to some things I've read. Uh, very little money has been spent on supporting internet activities to allow Iranians to have more access to Western news. Uh, what are your comments? Well, on my first comment about the, the news is, and I, I hate to say this, and Bob's in the room, but um, uh, the government's not always the best at doing um, exciting and interesting programming. And so the, uh, <laughs> what a shock, I know. Um, the, the, the internet television, which most Iranians watch, is actually run by a private company. And uh, BBC, bless its heart, has been smart enough to give them a bunch of contracts to produce news shows. And they do quite good documentaries with BBC funding. And, and I wish that we took a chunk of the money that we now spend on VOA and instead used it to fund Manotou's uh, documentaries. Quite good. But, uh, and they do it to make money run advertisements and so um, My complaints against the VOA are m mostly that they're, um, I don't think much of the quality of their professional broadcasting. Uh, we don't need cooking shows. Um, and um, I really wish that they were run more like NPR and, and less like uh, uh, the government bureaucracy they are. But that's a different issue. On the internet, I agree with you. There's a real problem that we face, though, which is that, um, you know, the programs that to evade um, the supervise, super, uh, snooping by the Iranian authorities are precisely the programs that drive the FBI nuts. And the encryption programs 
that the FBI says are such a threat to our civilized society are the conscription programs that the Iranians want to be able to communicate free from interference in their government. So the FBI has complained about some of the programs the State Department has paid for. Because, whoops, Americans use them too, right? So we got a problem. But I do think that we should be doing more in encouraging internet stuff. My institute's starting a Persian website next month. Um, but, you know, in spite of Khamenei's fantasies that it would, uh, that, that foreign sponsored radio stations are the real source of trouble, that's overwhelmingly not true. What's overwhelmingly the source of trouble is what Iranians themselves <coughs> produce. So uh, Iran's a country of 80 million people and 85 million smartphones. 40 million Iranians have accounts on what's called Telegram, which is a program that's really quite good at um, keeping, sorry, uh, 40 million Amer Iranians have programs on Telegram, which is a program that's quite good at uh, blocking government um, snooping. Um, and it's, that's, that's really the source of what matters. Now, sure, there's lots of fake news out there uh, in Iran. I mean, but not anyway. That, that's how the information gets out. Yeah, back here. Uh, Iris uh, How long a shelf life do you think the Islamic Republic has? When do you think it will expire? And I'd like to add a, a sub question or two here first. Communism has a certain shelf life. It's expired in some cases, not all. Uh, do you think Islamism has a longer shelf life because it's more deeply rooted in its national society, or less because it's even more incompetent and has less of a universal appeal? And then second, what about contingencies? To what extent is the shelf life affected by if the United States were to have a comprehensive program to bring it down, as Peter Schweitzer argued Reagan did with the Soviet Union? Uh, or is it mostly not contingent on that, mostly just on internal dialogue and political development? And final contingency, we're getting a nuclear weapon extended shelf life. So uh, back in 1997, when on the unexpected election of a reformist president took place, and the agency organized a big event with all kinds of Iranians coming in, all kinds of people who are Iranian experts coming in talking about it. I made the prediction. He said, I have no idea what's going to happen in the next 25 months, but I'd be very surprised the Islamic Republic lasts another 25 years. Oops, that's getting close. I hope people have forgotten about that. Um, I don't know. My worry now is that the Islamic Republic, I think, is most likely to evolve into a typical military-run uh, dictatorship in the Middle East that's more corrupt than is illogical. That's not the Islamic Republic, but it sure ain't no free democratic society. So uh, what replaces the Islamic Republic may not be very pretty. That's okay with me. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, but you know, I, I, I hope better for the Iranian people. Okay? I hope better for the Iranian people. Um, what can we do about it? Probably not that much. You know, the business of overthrowing the Eastern Bloc countries worked once. Uh, Khamenei has read hundreds of books about that experience. He's intensely aware of it. It's something that preoccupies the entire leadership of the Revolutionary Guard Corps. It's one of the reasons why they come down so hard on uh, all kinds of civil society organizations. Um, it's really hard to replicate something like that. When you have a really unexpected massive victory like that, it's hard to duplicate. And I, I think it's unrealistic to anticipate that what will happen in Iran would follow that same model. Um, how long it's going to last? I mean, I mean, is Islamism more rooted in their societies than communism was? I don't know. I mean, um, I can give you good arguments for and against. Um, and I don't think we have a good sense. As I say, our track record of predicting revolutions is miserable. We have, 
not entirely unmarked by, by success, but pretty close. So, don't know. I think we should have contingency plans in effect. Now, is a nuclear weapon going to help extend the life of the Islamic Republic? Uh, the, the answer is almost certainly yes. Because there's certainly going to be some nationalist pride in having this, in some sense that um, we are invulnerable. Um, and that's going to be part. And then also, be honest, there are going to be many actors who are going to be afraid to, uh, to move against the government if it has a nuclear weapon. Right. Just, yeah, a few already. Just okay. Could so, you wait to the mic, please? Oh, thank you. Could you talk a little bit about the prospects of uh, an Israeli-Iranian conflict? Um, many conflicts start from miscalculation. The 2006 conflict between Israel and Hezbollah certainly started from miscalculation. Hezbollah's leader said after it was over that had he had any idea how the Israelis would react when they kidnapped the Israeli soldiers, he wouldn't have done it. Um, and I think that uh, it would not take much to start an Israeli-Hezbollah uh, confrontation at the moment. All it would take is, you know, some Hezbollah uh, rocket which lands in a kindergarten and kills 30 kids. I mean, I, there are all kinds of scenarios in which um, there could be an inadvertent conflict. Um, and in, a conflict between the two sides is widely anticipated by both Hezbollah fighters and the Israeli Defense Forces. They are both, they have both come to, con to the conviction in the last six months, that it's, it, it, it's more likely than not that there will be a conflict in 2018. And that it will come from an inadvertent conflict. And that it will be more bloody and deadly than all the Israeli Arab wars to date. That's the conviction on both sides. I hope to God they're wrong. I hope to God they're wrong. You've talked about the perhaps changing attitudes by the, um, the rural, rural people in maybe a couple hundred towns. Um, what is the situation with, with the uh, more educated segments and, and, and business classes uh, in, in their view of, of their government there? Well, one of the interesting phenomena that's taken place in Iran in the last 20 years is the spread of education. Uh, for the last 10 years, university participation rates in Iran have exceeded that in the United States. Um, and by the way, they're much higher among women than they are among men. Ir Iran is one of the few countries in the world where the majority of those getting PhDs in physics are women. Every subject, every subject, including all the, all the STEM subjects at every level. Um, and one of the things which has happened is the rural areas are going away. Um, about 30% of Iranians live in rural areas. More Iranians live in the top four big cities than live in the rural areas. Um, and uh, Iran's countryside is depopulated. So a large part of what's happening is a real pro process of social change, urbanization, education. And, and these people want to participate in the world. And that's a real problem for the Islamic Republic real problem with the Islamic Republic. Their natural base of rural and small town folk is disappearing. And the natural base of reform-minded, western-oriented people, namely well-educated people living in big cities, is growing rapidly. It's not good for the Islamic Republic. I'm going to take the privilege of asking the last question. I, I just simply point out, in regard to cooking shows, <laughs> that uh, 
al, -ir al Iraqiya, the TV station, yes, national well television well. station we started in Iraq. Did well with cooking shows. Had a yes. cooking show yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, featuring ingredients which were not available in that country. Right. So you, you never know. Uh -huh. There are good cooking shows and bad, bad cooking, cooking shows. shows. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Ro roast pork is not a frequent <laughs> recipe. <laughs> Regarding Iran and its activities throughout the Middle East, to what extent are they animated by millenarian ambitions? In the age of Ahmadinejad, it seemed clearly to be driven by millenarian ambitions. To what extent is it a, a resuscitation of, of ancient Persian hegemonic desires? Uh, and in this arc to the Mediterranean that they're creating through Iran and Syria and into Lebanon, do you think uh, this leaves them vulnerable in terms of the Iranian population, or their successes there will consolidate a base of support in the Iranian population, which is a way of asking is the Iranian population, is there, is there a millenarian sector of it? Do they, are they driven by Shia dreams of the return of the Gulf Imam or by Persian ambitions? Or is, is the regime leaving them behind in there? And just to complicate the question a little further, we have the head of Lebanese um, intelligence state security here uh, at the end of last year and then someone raised the question about the Iranian ambitions and Hezbollah's cooperation and consolidating their presence in Syria. He said, well, if you don't like this art, why don't you do something about it? Well, millenarianism in Iran is primarily anti-clericalism. Anti-clericalism, right. It is because anti-clericalism. Anti because you see, if you think that you're speaking directly to the Mahdi, then what do you need the Ayatollahs for? <laughs> and since the grand tradition is that when the Ayatollah returns, one of the things he's going to do is kill all the, uh, when the Mahdi returns, one of the things he's going to do is kill all the Ayatollahs. <laughs> so millenarianism is overwhelmingly anti clerical mm. And I'm, that was Ahmadinejad's agenda. Okay? So that plays kind of differently than you might have thought, right? I mean, that's why people are millenarian. They want to get rid of these damn Ayatollahs. There's a lot of proud nationalism in Iran. It sees Iran as a great civilization. I like to give my, I, I do a thing four times a year for ODI, um, Iran 101 thing. And uh, I like to start by putting up maps of what Iran's looked like for most of the last 2,500 years. And I remind people that the first marathon was to bring news of the desperate battle against the mighty Persian army invading Europe. And that beautiful building in the middle of India, the Taj Mahal, has all those lovely inscriptions on it that are written in Persian, because that's the language spoken by the people who built it. That is the Iranian sense of their natural space. Okay? Oops, it's shrunk in recent centuries. Right? At 200 years ago, Iran was twice its present size. So you can play into nationalism pretty easily. I, by the way, when I, I was speaking to Jewish audiences a lot at the time of the uh, JCPOA. And I, I, I like to point out that um, the Western Wall in Jerusalem, who paid for that? Cyrus. Cyrus. <laughs> it's in the Bible. Cyrus, the one who paid for the Second Temple. Okay. He who pays the piper gets to call the tune. So, you know, it's. Uh, yeah. So, anyway, there's a lot of nationalism. It's been a resurgent in recent years, and um, the regime is pretty good at playing. But it, I get a little nervous about it, too. Because it, it often takes an anti-regime tone. 
So there's been this whole, you know, Cyrus, we are with you thing that turned out a couple hundred thousand people every year now. At, uh, in, in, uh, and um, the regime does not like that. You know, Cyrus is not exactly Muslim, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, right. so but, but what actions to disrupt the arc? You know, the, the, this... The, the U.S. Uh, intelligence community thinks that this fascination with this land bridge, this arc, is, is a crock. Because they say, look, you know, a lot of that you're driving across great big huge stretches of desert where it's real obvious when you're driving a convoy across that. And it's really easy to hit that, whether you're an Israeli or an American or a Turk. Mm -hmm. They say, that's eh, really... <laughs> They're not worried about it so much. So I've participated in any number of meetings in which various people from the Middle East have been yelled at by the U.S. intelligence community about stop obsessing about this land art. I don't know if it's true or not, but I just, that's... The U.S. government is convinced it's not as big an issue as the Middle Easterners make it out to be. Has Hezbollah got their... No, Hezbollah got thousands of very, very few weapons that way. Uh, the good Lord invented airplanes for a purpose. Right, okay. Well, yeah. well anyway, Patrick, thank you.